chapter 1. We're going to take our message tonight from verses 11 through 14. And uh, the title of the message tonight is this, The Gospel Committed to the Trust of a Man Who Was Once an Evil Man. Let me say that again because it's borne out in this message tonight. The Gospel Committed to the Trust of a Man Who Was Once an Evil Man. Now begin reading with me at verse 11, and we will read down through verse 14. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor, injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you tonight for your precious word. From which, Lord, we were able to come to know you. And from which, Father, we find instruction and encouragement every day. And Father, we pray tonight as we talk about these verses that we just read. That, Lord, we might share a message. One of encouragement. Uh, one of instruction. One of great understanding, Lord, in terms of how you work. We pray, Father, that if someone would be lost here tonight, that they'd come to know Christ as their Savior. I pray, Father, that you would fill me with your Spirit, that you would enable me to be the preacher-teacher that I need to be, and that you would get the glory. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. When confronted with the facts of who God chooses to preach His gospel, we are often taken back. The Bible tells us very distinctly that holy men of God literally wrote the books of the Bible. And yet, when confronted with some of the evil things they did, we're taken back a bit. God doesn't choose men to do His bidding as man would choose. We are told in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 27 that God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. That word foolish comes from a Greek word that means, listen very carefully, dull or stupid. As if shut up. Heedless, blockhead, absurd. Our God disdains human wisdom. This is seen by the fact that He disallows it as a means to know Him and also by choosing to save or bring to serve likewise the lowly. God uses those who would uh, commonly be considered foolish Weak 
and of no consequence. To convey the message of the gospel. Thus his messengers or servants have never included many who were wise or mighty or noble. He does not call to salvation many whom the world would call wise, mighty, and noble. Jesus in Matthew 11.25 gave the Father thanks that He revealed the Messiah and the truth to babes rather than the wise and prudent, says one Bible scholar. There is a sarcasm in those words as Jewish leaders are ironically identified as wise and prudent and the followers of Christ babes, literally infants. Jesus states in Matthew 18.3 Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. He meant by those words, teachable and moldable. Tonight we want to see the Apostle Paul give God thanks for the gospel being committed to his trust, especially in light, of his terrible past. Aren't you glad to hear tonight, those of you who know Jesus Christ as your Savior, that your terrible past is under the blood of Christ? Aren't you glad that God forgave you of all your sins and not just a few? Aren't you glad that God loved you when you were the most miserable of people. The giving of thanks by Paul for God entrusting the gospel to him. That's the first and only point. Let me say it again. The giving of thanks by Paul for God entrusting the gospel to him. First of all, let me say this. This is very important. Anyone who has come to know Christ as their Savior ought to be a grateful person. There ought to be a gratitude about you that never ceases. If you have at least one thing to give thanks for, it's your salvation. Imagine where you'd be headed tonight. If God hadn't saved you. Imagine the guilt that you might be carrying around with you. Imagine with me for a moment being cast into the lake of fire. Paul saw the gospel entrusted to him as a, write this down, very valuable thing. We're going to talk about that word entrusted in just a few minutes. Very valuable thing. Paul calls the gospel the glorious gospel. Would you look please at uh, verse 11. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God. The word glorious comes from a Greek word that means to render or esteem glorious uh, to honor or magnify. The gospel manifests, magnifies God because it reveals God's glory. Now, this is a mouthful, so you may want to shorten the note a little bit, but I need to say it all and not miss anything. That is the perfections of his person and his attributes, including 
His holiness, hatred for sin. And justice, demand of punishment for violators of His law. And grace, forgiveness of sins. Those particular attributes are key to any effective gospel presentation. If you're going to tell people that they need to be saved, you're going to have to tell them why. They're a sinner. I'm afraid today there are a lot of misconcepts concerning how people think they look in God's eyes. They're more about what they look like in someone else's eyes. There's a misconception when somebody says it because God is love. He'll not send anybody to hell. Our God is just as well as loving. And His justice demands punishment. But you and I know that He sent Christ to the cross so that we wouldn't have to receive that punishment. Jesus Christ became our redemption. What is it that put Christ on that cross? The love of God. The love of God. Paul is grateful that such a gospel is committed to his trust. The word committed comes from a Greek word that means the committing of something of great value to another and can be translated entrusted. I'm sure there are different ones of you here today or tonight that have had someone uh, come to you and uh, say, I'm going to trust that you take care of this for me. I always get a little scared when somebody does that because... I figure before it's all over with, that thing's going to either get lost or stolen or broken, and they're going to get mad at me. And so I'm kind of very careful about this idea of being entrusted with certain things. But listen, I'm not worried about this idea of being entrusted with the gospel. It's a valuable thing and in need of being entrusted to. God trusted Paul with the communication and guardianship of His revealed truth. Folks, I ask you tonight, where would you be if divine truth hadn't been revealed to you? If you think that's a minor thing, imagine with me for a moment how many people in the world today do not know anything about divine truth. I tell you what it makes me feel like sometimes, makes me feel special. That God would love such a person as me and reveal that divine truth so that I could have my sins forgiven. We are reminded that in earlier verses of this chapter that there were those who could not be trusted with truth. Look at verse 7. Back up to verse 7. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say, nor whereof they affirm. Now I'm going to say this to you, and you may misunderstand me, you may disagree, I don't care. I happen to believe that many of the false teachers in the world honestly believe that what they're saying is true. Now that's a hard concept because I would say how can anyone believe such a thing as that? But they do. We'll talk about it in a few minutes but really they're blind people. And unfortunately they lead blind people. In chapter 6 of verse 20 of 1 Timothy would you turn there with me for a moment because it, it bears out what I just said. In verse 20... Paul says to Timothy, O oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. What is that? That's the gospel. Avoiding profane and vain babblings 
and the oppositions of science falsely so called I want to suggest something to you here before I move on a lot of what's going around concerning this COVID is superstition it's not science science is based on revealed facts Superstition is based on things that have never been proven. Now where does superstition come from? The devil. Satan loves it when God's people live in fear. Nobody ought to be living in fear. Perfect love casteth out fear. That's what the Bible says. But tonight we have a bunch of people that say it's science my wife said to me the other day she she had heard it for the I don't know how many times we've heard it on the news you know she said do they really know what science is all about I said I don't think so now watch this Paul told Timothy to avoid certain things that were going around at that time there's always something going around. But notice why, verse 21, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Professing mean made some kind of a profession of faith. But they've erred. Now, why did they err? Because they did what he told Timothy not to do. He says, avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so-called. Beloved, one of the things of Paul's day and ours is that there are false teachers. Uh, many of them today fall along the same line as being so-called preachers of the law. Let me tell you something. If somebody tells you tonight that you can lose your salvation, you better not listen to them. Why? Because they don't understand the law. God never intended that the law save anybody. What the law does is make clear that you and I are sinners. That's what it does. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt have no other God before me. <clears throat> Sometimes, concerning false teachers, they mix truth. Who's behind that one, folks? And sometimes they just outright deny it. Either way, those kind of people are not to be trusted with the gospel. Jesus is truth. Our Lord says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Sinners are only set free by revealed truth. Look at John 8 and verse 32. John 8 and verse 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What is it that Satan doesn't want to have happen tonight? For people to be revealed truth which comes by way of the gospel and so consequently he puts all kind of ideas in their head one might be I'm a church member I really don't need to hear this other might be you know I've been doing really good on my own I don't think I really need God you've heard them haven't you haven't you all kind of stuff out there. What, what, what is that all about? It's keeping someone from hearing the truth. It causes a person to shut his ears off. 
Just stay blind. Nothing else mixed with the gospel saves a person. Not everyone can have the gospel entrusted to their trust. That's the point that Paul's making here tonight in this place here in 1 Timothy. Second part of this message. Paul saw himself enabled to be trusted with the gospel. Look please if you will at verse 11 again. Excuse me. Uh, verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that He counted me faithful putting me into the ministry. Well how does the gospel enable? It enables by revealed truth. Here in the next few verses we see that it was Paul's testimony of his salvation that provides a contrast between his proper understanding of the law and the misconceptions of false teachers and between the glory of the true gospel and the emptiness of false doctrine. Beloved, outside of true salvation, there can be no understanding for the purpose of the law and no receiving of divine truth. False teachers, I said this earlier and I want to say it again, genuinely believe they are teaching truth. Turn to Matthew 15, 14 please. Matthew 15, 14. Words of Jesus. Matthew 15, 14. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Write this down. That word ditch comes from a Greek word. It simply means a hole in the ground or a pit. It uh, most likely refers to the bottomless pit. And I'll say why in just a minute. But look with me at Revelation chapter 20 and verse 1. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit a great chain in his hand. I said to you that I would show you why I think it probably refers to uh, the abyss. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But those words, let them alone. You see that in Matthew 15, 14, let them alone. This speaks to God's severe judgment in the form of His wrath. That's what those words really are in reference to. Let them alone. I'm going to deal with them. It signifies abandonment by God and is described as giving them over. Please look at Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the 
things that are made, even the eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Let me tell you something. One of these days, unsaved people are going to meet Jesus Christ the great white throne judgment. There will not be an acceptable excuse brought forth by any of them. One won't be able to say, well, you know, I was brought up a Catholic. Well, my family was a member of the Methodist Church. Or my daddy was always a Baptist. <laughs> There's no excuses. You reject Jesus Christ, the only thing you can have to look forward to is the wrath of God. Now, I don't say that with a smirk such as our vice president seems to like to do from time to time. I don't wish hell on anyone. When Jesus said, let them alone, I don't think he was uh, talking about the fact that you couldn't yet try to reach them. He was simply saying, don't try to sit there and talk them out of what they're doing. Amen. Now listen to this because we need to carry it through. Paul tells us he was enabled by the very gospel entrusted to him. 1 Timothy 1.12 He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me or that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. He notes the awful evil person he was before he was saved. Verse 13. Notice he says, who was before a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Listen very carefully. He was a blasphemer. One who speaks evil of God and slanders God. Think about that for a moment. That's who God chose to entrust the gospel to. This guy that was once a slanderer of Him. As one Bible scholar, Paul violated the first half of the Ten Commandments through his overt attacks against Christ. Look at Acts chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, please. Acts 9, 4 and 5. Christ accuses him of his awful deed. Acts 9, 4 and 5. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him in the red letters, that's Christ, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Wow. You know, any time the church is persecuted, Christ is persecuted. You know that, right? And the church was being persecuted, so thus Christ was being persecuted. He was a persecutor and an insolent man. Paul violated the second half of the Ten Commandments through his attack tax on believers. The Greek word for injurious or literally insolent insolent man can be translated violent aggressive indicating the violence Paul heaped on Christians. Can you understand why Ananias when God called upon him to go and <clears throat> take away Paul's blindness was reluctant. 
Can you understand that? Uh, listen, Paul, as a persecutor, it was not a mild case of persecution. It was a horrible case. Paul was a violent man. He had so much hatred against Christ that he took it out on every believer he came in contact with. But note, as Paul stated, he did it ignorantly. Please look at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13. He says, I did it ignorantly in unbelief. No one, listen very carefully, absolutely no one is capable of realizing what they are able to do while being an unbeliever. I suggest to you that some of those that are in prison today for violent crimes, some of them came out of homes where the Bible was an important part of the life of the family. You know, a child can be raised in a godly home and not become a godly person. Is that right? And unfortunately, that's happening today as it's been happening for a long time. Paul was neither a Jewish apostate nor a Pharisee who clearly understood Jesus' teaching thus for a period of time rejected him he was a zealous says one bible scholar fastidious Jew trying to earn his salvation fastidious means very critical hard to please as far as Paul was concerned that law was everything Anybody that went against it was in a fight with him. But he was lost. Paul's plea or claim, if you will, of innocence was not an excuse of his part to deny guilt. It was simply a statement indicating that he did not understand the truth of Christ's gospel and was honestly trying to protect his religion. They said, I wonder how many people today stand behind the sacred desk and try to protect their religion but don't speak the truth. Well, this is what we Presbyterians believe. You know, I tell people who ask me about my salvation, I'm a Christian before I'm a Baptist. Oh, I'm a Baptist. I'm not going to take that away. Because I believe that what they believe, I believe. But I'm a Christian first. I don't have to protect Christianity. But I need to be sure that I speak the truth. His willing repentance when confronted by Christ is evidence that he did not understand the ramifications of his actions. Note that Paul states, 1 Timothy 1.12, for that he counted me faithful. I find that an interesting statement in the midst of all that he says about himself. And I just say this to you. No one should be in a ministry of any kind who is not faithful. You realize being faithful to God is doing what God has called you to do when it's convenient and when it's inconvenient. 
It's being willing to do it if you have to stand alone. Not sure about some of this generation that's coming along understands that yet. I don't. Such is God's purpose for Paul and for all believers through personal faith that they be faithful. And to Paul was turned by the Holy Spirit from self-righteous works to faith alone in Christ he could not be used by God. He was in the same condition as the useless false teacher spoken of in verses 6 and 7. He makes the contrast. That's what I said to you earlier. But notice what he says in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 14. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Are you not glad tonight that God's grace is an abundant thing? You know, you cannot run the well of grace dry. How many of you in here have ever had a well that ran dry? Your preacher has. A couple of different places. It's an awful thing. You've got the spigot on, you know. And all of a sudden you hear a shh. And then out comes a little mud. Oh my soul. We just ran out of water. We bought a house off of a man down in Smithfield. Actually, Tunkhannock, I'm sorry. My memory failed me for a moment. Tunkhannock, Pennsylvania. He promised me that the well was uh, 18 foot of water in it. You know, good size well. That sounds pretty good. Well, first of all, the well was only 12 foot deep. How did you find that out? One wife run the well dry the first day in there. Was I angry? Would you have been angry? About $30,000 for a house. In the first place, he kept trying to move the line all the time before we got to the time when the lawyer you know, meets with you and does everything. I finally said, hey, either it stops right now moving the line or I'm done. That thing was his wife was in our church. He was a nice person. I couldn't say it for him. He was phony as a $3 bill. He put on a good face for a little while. This is very careful. We're talking about the well of grace. It's deep. It's so plentiful that there's not one person that cannot be saved if that person trusts Christ for salvation. It's God's grace that replaces our sinful debt. So that we can say with surety to be absent from the body, the presence of the Lord. Oh, I know that we may be facing some awful things down the road. I know that. Let me tell you something what Jesus said, and I believe it. He says, Fear him who is able to destroy both the body and soul in hell. You can take my life, but you can't take my soul. You see, my soul belongs to God. So if I die today or tomorrow or 20 years from now, who knows? 
who knows how long we'll be around here. Ask him for the body, press him for one. There's no way he'll ever forsake me. I tell him sometimes I've forsaken me a long time. I'm not about me. There's no way he'll stop loving me. In this world, people stop loving people, don't they? I don't love you anymore. He'll never say that to me. He's my Savior. And you know what? I would all be you. Because what I have in you, I don't deserve. What a gracious God. Abundant mercy. We'll talk more about that next Sunday. But I have to close it up.